Well, I don't know if you have been anything like me this last week watching the uh, Titan submersible that they were trying to rescue. I couldn't get enough of it. I just kept watching and watching on my, iP- my phone, looking up news apps, trying to figure out when they would get this thing, if they would get this thing, how they would find it. And it was interesting because when it first happened, I learned uh, you know, that they lost communication about two-thirds of the way down on their trip, and then there was no more communication. And I kind of thought, if there was no more communication and it didn't float back to the surface, something really bad happened. But there was a part of me that wanted to hope and pray that they would survive. I kind of, I kind of wondered why, too, there was so much attention on that. Why would there be so much attention on these five people when we all know that there's people that are dying all over our country, people that are dying all over our world? And I think it's because of that sense of adventure, that sense of discovering something new. And I also think that it's, it's a, a wonder of why would someone put theirself into that situation? I kept wondering, too, why James Cameron didn't speak out. So he's the one that directed Titanic. And he'd been down there over 33 times he'd been to the Titanic. He even said that he probably spent more time on that ship than the original captain did. (laughs) So I'm struck by, James Cameron said that I'm struck by the similarity of the Titanic disaster itself, where the captain was repeatedly warned about ice ahead of the ship. And yet, he steamed full speed into an ice field on a moonless night, and many people died as a result. He would go on to say that for a very similar tragedy with the Titan, there were warnings that went unheeded to take place at the very exact site with all the diving that's going on around the world. I think it's just astonishing, really quite astonishing, astonishing that would happen at the same place as the Titanic. He said, I knew that's where we're going to find it. Ocean Gate should have never gone down. It was pretty clear. And I wish I would have been more vocal about it. He wishes he would have been more vocal. He said it was a Father's Day, and father and son were one of the pairs that went down there that paid half a million dollars to go down into the sea. He said it's tragic and unnecessary. He said, and by the way, it's not lost on me. Somebody who studied the meaning of Titanic, its greater meaning to us historically in society, it's about warning being ignored. So warnings that are being ignored. There was a letter sent to the Titan uh, company Ocean Gate back in March of 2018, where they told them about this, uh, their concern about the way that they were building this ship. Ocean Gate's former director who brought up the same concerns and said he was very concerned about the the way the ship was being built. And when he spoke out, they fired him. So just as the Titanic sank when there was a warning, and just as the Titan sank when there was a warning, these warnings were being ignored. We have a tendency to ignore warnings. And it's happened all throughout our history. The scriptures talk about warnings today. Our first reading, Jeremiah the prophet, describes what it's like for someone who speaks out, what it's like for someone who gives a warning. He says, you will experience terror, terror on every side. Let us denounce him. He goes on to say that all those who are my friends are on watch for any misstep of mine. Perhaps he will be trapped, then we can prevail vengeance on him. He's worried that when he speaks the truth, he's going to be attacked for it. And if we speak the truth, we're going to be attacked for it. We live in such a polarized society that no matter what we say, someone is bound to, to, to pounce on us. It's terrifying sometimes to speak the truth, especially to a society that doesn't want to hear it. And yet Jesus tells us in the gospel today, fear no one. Just like the Titan and Titanic, all things will be revealed. We will look back and understand and think, why didn't I say something about things that are happening in our day? 
And then he warns us. He says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but be afraid of those who can kill both body and soul. He's telling us, don't be afraid of people that will kill us for our faith, but be afraid of those that can destroy the soul and body in Gehenna. Satan is the destroyer. He is the one that wants to see us all dragged into hell in his own insidious ways. So now, today, what are the warnings in our life? What are the warnings in our time that we are tending to ignore? How are our bodies and souls being destroyed? What are the issues that need to be spoken about? So the United States bishops uh, met recently to discuss some of the issues that are going on today. And this past Friday, our bishop met with, met with all the priests. He commanded that we all come to this meeting to hear this important message. And he, they, they said they've come to the conclusion that if we don't talk about these issues, and if we don't talk soon and strong and powerfully about them, if we don't follow through with these, something catastrophic can happen in our country. Before I mention these issues, I just want to acknowledge a couple things. So first of all, we live in a cancel culture. If we don't like what somebody says, we cancel them. Um, we, we tend to write people off whenever we don't like what we hear. But we don't have to be that way. We don't have to be a cancel culture. We don't have to leave when we don't agree with something. But we need to speak the truth. In the gospel today, Jesus says nothing is concealed that will not be revealed. And what you hear in secret speak from the housetops. I want you to know that I'm trembling a little bit right now. I tremble about speaking these words because I love you. And I wouldn't want anyone to leave our faith or our church because of something that I might say. And I beg and pray that God uses me as his instrument. I make a holy hour every single day, and I pray with the upcoming readings, and I just beg God, please, speak the words your people long to hear, and let me stay out of the way. So I hope I can trust you enough as friends, and that I can love you enough as father, that I can help speak the truth. So in these coming months, there are going to be difficult issues that I need to preach about. Many say keep politics out of the church and separation of church and state. But the church is supposed to speak about these issues. The church is supposed to shape our morals. And I think that I can speak for all of us that we, that, that we say there are many issues that, that are dividing us. There's an increased polarization. I thought many times, and others have shared insights, that America... People tend to identify themselves first with a political party and then with their Catholic faith. So we usually identify ourselves with a party and we put that on top of our faith. And it's, it's got to be the opposite way. Our faith has to be first and influence our party. So it's interesting. I was reading something from the American Journal of Political Science and researchers, researchers found that our ideologies, our political ideologies, shape our morals. And it was very clear that, that, that the politics would shape what we believe. And it's supposed to be the opposite. Our morals should shape how we interact with, with politics. So to simplify this, we're not called to follow the donkey or the elephant. We're called to follow Christ, the lamb. Right? We're not called to follow the donkey or the elephant. We're called to follow the lamb. So do we want politics to shape our morality? Or do we want our morality to shape politics? I wonder if it's people that think they don't want politics preached when they, they hear a truth that doesn't resonate with their political party. My belief is if we follow Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life, he will lead us to everlasting life. He will help us not to enter into something that would be catastrophic 
for our country. Pope Francis says that an authentic faith always involves a deep desire to change the world, to transmit values, to leave this earth somehow better than we found it. We love this magnificent planet on which God has put us, and we love the human family which dwells here with all its tragedies and struggles, its hopes and aspirations, its strengths and weakness. The earth is our common home, and all of us are brothers and sisters. And the just ordering of society and of the state is the central responsibility of politics. The church cannot and must not remain on the sidelines. So let me be a father to you. Listen to the messages so that we don't find ourselves in another catastrophic loss of life. In the upcoming weeks, I'm going to write this stuff in the bulletin so it's very clear in black and white what the bishops are asking of us. But we do have a tendency to let warnings go unheeded. And we can't avoid a catastrophic event in our diocese if we stick together and proclaim the gospel. So the two issues that we'll be dealing with in the next months, in August and then in November, both are facing children. One is the, uh, and they both, they both face these things happening without a parent's consent. So one is the mutilization of children, and the other is sanctity of life in the womb. We need to come together as church and protect these lives both the mother and the child. And remember, we don't have to let politics divide us. We're not following the donkey or the elephant. We're following the lamb. 